Welcome. Welcome to our latest public health conversation starter. This is a series of discussions we are having with thinkers who provide a critical perspective on the way of public on the on the work of public health. Today, I have the privilege of speaking with Joyal Malheran. She's a, a public policy expert based in Washington, DC, with over 15 years of experience working with governors, the White House, and distinguished nonprofit ventures. She served as Chief Strategy Officer with Partnership for a Healthier America, a nonprofit chaired by former First Lady Michelle Obama. She's a founder of Evermore, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting bereaved children and families. I am delighted she is with us today. Thank you, Joelle, for joining us. So, Joelle, Hi, you... Dr. Galeo. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Can you just talk a little bit about your background? Can you just run us through how you come to do what you do? Sure. So I am a basic scientist by training. I'm a molecular biologist and biochemist who didn't want to go to med school and didn't want to work in a lab. And so I started my career in Washington, D.C., working for the American Cancer Society. And because I also have a degree in English, I also was consulting for the National Academies of Science and translating their reports to state legislatures. Over time, um, I was invited to join the staff of the National Governors Association and help staff the uh, incoming chairman, uh, former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee, on his national initiative around health and wellness and obesity, which really, I think, launched me more into the public health angle and the public health work of what I ended up doing. Um, from there, I had um, I, I left NGA and then began advising the Obama administration. Um, the former first lady had an initiative called Let's Move, and my job was to help advise um, the administration and broker agreements with corporate America around children's health and well-being. Um, while I was there, um, and actually just prior to joining the White House uh, work, I had a very sick, we had a very sick child um, who died, and it was a really lousy experience. Um, and not just from an emotional perspective, but all of the systems around our family began to break down in pretty profound ways. And so I was sort of really emotionally distraught for quite some time. I went and did the White House work, um, which was very helpful. But during that time, there were a number of high-profile death events in the media. There were the Chicago homicides, Trayvon Martin, Hydea Pendleton, Sandy Hook, the hotshot firefighters, the Jasper tornadoes. And I just began thinking, people who have lost someone that they love really need something far more than a support group or a therapist. And so I started walking the streets of Washington and talking to residents about their, um, their life events and tragedies. And more often than not, I realized that far more many, far more many people than I anticipated had really traumatic bereavement and death experiences that altered the course of their life. And so that's what got me started down on this path. And I'm happy to sort of dive into the science and the details and other work that we've been doing. Well, as um, you know, we discussed off camera, it's uh, what you've been through is um, horrific. And I'm really sorry you went through that. And I'm sorry for everybody who goes through these experiences. Can let's yeah. talk a little bit about, um, about grieving for a second. And uh, you know, we're taping this in the pretty immediate post-COVID period. And uh, COVID was an enormous tragedy in, uh, in this country with 1.1 million people dying. And I often find in public health, it's hard to wrap your brain around 1.1 million people, right? But you can wrap your brain around somebody's child, somebody's mother, somebody's father, somebody's uncle, somebody's lover. Can you talk to me, how did we do in terms of helping people grieve nationally? Like, like how... How do you see the picture through the lens of not just what you've been through personally, but actually through this professional path that you've taken where you've spent so much time thinking about these issues? Sure. I think COVID was, is really a turning point or has been a turning point. I mean, before COVID, and I went to Congress pre-COVID, concerned that bereavement was a massive public health issue um, because at the time we had, and we still do, concurrent mortality epidemics underway. But COVID really was something that caught the public's attention. Um, you know, even beyond the sheer mortality numbers, it's just everything that everyone was grappling with. 
um, at some juncture in their life. COVID has opened the door, in my opinion, to talk more about the mortality events that are underway um, and grief and grieving. And I'll just sort of note that grief um, used to denote, uh, you know, the feeling surrounding a death. But since COVID, grief and grieving is now used pretty, pretty, pretty widely. You know, you can be grieving a divorce, you can be grieving you know, a loss of a job, for example. And so um, in some ways, it's bolstered the conversation around grief and grieving, but it's also diluted it in some ways, which when we do our work um, in looking at public policy and systems and data around bereavement, we're really conscious about using the terminology bereavement to signify that we're talking about the death or the loss of someone significant in an individual's life. Talk to me a little bit about how do we make this better? I mean, you know, the individual loss is a, is, is, a, is a horrible human experience. And, uh, you know, but in public health, we believe in systems and building systems to improve lives. And how do we make this better? So I think one fact that a lot of people aren't aware of, and when I went to Congress, you know, Congress wasn't aware of this either, that a death event it precedes other public emergencies. So a death event is not just a personal tragedy. The folks who are exposed to the death event itself or the death, a death of an immediate um, family, friend, or close loved one, they themselves become at risk of other public emergencies. And so for example, um, we know that bereaved children, those are children, let's say, who've lost a parent, are at increased risk of academic failures, of substance misuse, of incarceration and violent crime, suicide attempts, suicide completions, premature death due to any cause. I mean, there's a long list. And it's not just for bereaved children. Those types of impacts are, are seen across other cohorts, so bereaved parents, bereaved siblings, or bereaved spouses, for example. Um, and I won't go into all the data for each of the cohorts, but we have very large population studies that show that the death event itself begins to alter the trajectory of an individual's life. And so one of the things that I've been talking to Congress and CDC and other federal agencies about is the current aperture of federal programs, policies, and priorities does not include a death event. So for example, in our suicide campaigns, we're not capturing people when they experience the death of a family member or a close friend as a potential intervention point that then prevents them from entering into these other public emergencies. And so some of the work that I'm doing right now is to widen that aperture. I would also say, I mean, we can talk about different policies um, that impact people that are just, they're just not on people's um, awareness or on their, on their radar screens right now. Um, but there's a lot of other things that we can do to begin orienting our systems, including our data systems, to understand both the breadth and the scope of the issue, which is actually, it's, it's pretty profound um, in scale, and it touches a lot of other public health emergencies that we talk about uh, frequently. Tell me, tell me about a couple of policies. So, for example, um, for bereaved children, we know from the data that more than 50% of bereaved and orphaned children in America do not receive their Social Security benefits that they're entitled to. Um, and as a result of those children, I mean, more often than not, we see children not getting those benefits, even though they're eligible. And when they do not receive those benefits, they grow up in greater poverty, they attain less academically, and through you know, retrospective studies, they earn less wages throughout the rest of their life as a result of not receiving that benefit. Um, another policy that um, we saw rolled back in the 80s. As a nation, we used to support post-secondary education for bereaved and orphaned children. We no longer do that today. And as a result of that, we saw nearly a 20% drop in college enrollment among bereaved and orphaned children. There are other um, economic policies. So for example, um, the Family Medical Leave Act 
death is not an eligible event for job protection or wage protection. And so if you experience the death of a child and you don't show up to work the next day, it is perfectly legal to be fired. And so there are a lot of policies that people just, I mean, again, it just hasn't been on the radar. It's not, I don't think it's any sort of malice or people um, not interested in the issue. It's just that the issue, I, has it been organized in such a way to raise awareness and to demonstrate the leverage points for the public health community and policymakers um, and foundations, for example, could could intercede on behalf of families? How, how do we talk about this? This is such a, a difficult issue that I, I think we as a society try to avoid it. And perhaps that's you know, protective. We're protecting ourselves, which I, which I understand. How do we... And perhaps how do we leverage this moment, this post-COVID moment, to actually have the conversation that can shift the policies that need to be shifted? That's a great question. You know, I am biased. I, I mean, this is, a, this is hard work. I will say that I often am having conversations with families. Um, I'm not on the front lines like a therapist might be or someone on the police force or a firefighting force but certainly have conversations with families. And the things that I'm told, um, they take a toll. They certainly, you know, it's, it's hard to hear. And it's also important, I think, to hear those things in order to orient the systems and the response um, in the aftermath to support families and first responders. We talk about a lot of other things as a country that I think are tough subjects or in previous generations have been tough subjects. And so I no longer believe that this is something that we can't talk about. This is part of an evolution of life, and it's something that nearly everyone will experience. And I think if we can begin having more casual conversations and supportive conversations and even understand how to talk to someone um, who's experienced um, these, these, these events, it begins to slowly... Um, remove barriers, and it's not as elusive as a topic to talk about. Perhaps it's Pollyanna of me to think of, to, to say, um, but but I, I I think it's an accessible topic. No, no, I, I actually I, I, I resonate with that, and I, and I often feel like the um, the more we talk about topics, the easier it is to talk about them. It sounds tautological, but in part that's why you and I are having this conversation. It is a conversation to advance conversations. Let me um, go to one data point that you shared with me, which is that um, indigenous children have been parentally bereaved in this country at a higher rate than all other racial and ethnic groups. You know, public health correctly focuses a lot on health gaps. Can you talk a little bit about the what elements of context we need to be addressing to narrow some of these health gaps in this context, bereavement gaps, and what should we be doing to help the groups that are really bearing a disproportionate amount of this bereavement throughout their life course? Yeah, if there's there's a couple things that keep me up at night. Um, one of them is the profound delta between indigenous children experiencing parental bereavement and the rest of children. Um, we did some work with Penn State and USC last year. Um, we knew that, um, or we suspected that Native Nation children were at precipitous risk. Um, when the data came back, it was really, I thought, stunning. Um, and so that's definitely one thing that keeps me up at night. Uh, the second is around incarceration. Um, There's some earlier studies, uh, not huge population size, but significant enough, I think, to raise an eyebrow, where we're looking at anywhere from 70 to 90 percent of incarcerated youth experience the death event just prior to being incarcerated, meaning that we're incarcerating many grieving children. Um, and I think that that is certainly a, an action point for public health and policymakers. I think from, you know, what are the things we can do? The playbook is, I think, can really be codified into four categories. There are economic, 
policies that we should be considering, like some that I mentioned earlier. There are health and health care policies. We have to attend to burnout and the people who are on the front lines. Um, and even ensuring that, let's say, a bereaved child who loses a parent may then experience health care insecurity beyond housing insecurity and food insecurity, um, among other things, after the death of a parent, just as an example. Um, the third category would be around community programming and really bolstering innovation in community programming. And the fourth, because I'm a scientist, I think we need to stay abreast of the science and have a coherent national agenda um, around these issues. You know, the, the one thing that I've encountered while doing this work is that there's a lot of foundation or federal dollars focused on uh, direct service, so therapy-based support for individuals. There is no foundation or philanthropist that we are aware of who is looking at policy and data systems. And I think, um, obviously I'm biased, but I think it is a profound oversight given the scale and the potential for a death event to alter the trajectory of, um, a, li a, a, of a life. You know, you, you talked about, about the policy landscape, and you've, you've been much more successful than the vast majority of people at, um, in, in, at working with both sides of the political aisle in a, in a very divided country. What's the common language on this issue? What's the common language that one needs to reach for that allows us to bring people together towards productive solutions? Yeah, I, well, thank you for mentioning that. I have been really humbled, not just by the families and the first responders who share their stories and have trusted me with, um, with really just very private information, but when I've gone to Congress, um, really have had very profound support from very conservative Republicans and very progressive Democrats. This is a universal issue. And the way I the way I talk about it is, um, I think, quite simple. It's a it's a little different. We don't have to go into all the details here. I don't talk about this as a mental health issue. Um, certainly, mental health is one component. Mental um, distress is one component that people will experience. But we know from large population studies that bereaved parents, children, siblings, and spouses are all at risk of premature death as a result of being bereaved. And so these types of messages, whether it was the Trump administration or the Biden administration, we've had really quite supportive conversations with policymakers. We've also worked really hard not to politicize this issue. I think you can, in a way, you can very quickly we can very quickly go down certain paths to do that. We've worked really hard not to do that. Um, I will also just say um, that both sides of the aisle have been very receptive to understanding the inequities that are driven by these events. Death events are not, like most public health issues, are not distributed equally. And as, you know, as we have a death care industry that's growing, um, we are also going to see growing inequities among certain populations in our society. And we need to work really hard now to put protections and safeguards in place so that we don't have, we don't continue to drive those inequities. And so far we've had, um, as you said, we've had some really phenomenal success. We'll see what the future brings. You know, one of the things uh, Joel have um, been struck by and enjoyed in our conversations is how positive you are. You know, in um, and and you've lived through a lot of grief. You know, in a world of much grief, what gives you hope? I'm so humbled by the people who have entrusted me um, in their stories and to carry this forward. I have gotten to know people where when I was in the halls of the White House, it, I wasn't going to be working with those folks or they weren't sharing, you know, I wasn't running into to folks in hardship neighborhoods or staying in people's homes or staying um, with people who were formerly incarcerated or who are on Medicaid. And on the weekends, you know, when I visit them, we go to 
different community events to make sure we can feed ourselves. It has been such a, um, it's, it's, it's just been such a humbling event, a humbling um, experience. And I honor all of those people who've shared their stories with me. In fact, at one point, I, I, I will say I'm not always positive. I was having a very difficult day. Um, we had a very young parent who died, and I was sort of beside myself. She um, was 30 and died in her sleep um, about a year to the almost a year to the anniversary of her daughter's death. And um, a series of other things happened, and I had a really rough day. And a mother. Um, from a hardship neighborhood happened to call me that night and said, you know, why are you so upset? Like what's happening with you? And um, she had just been evicted um, as a result of her son's death. Um, And I told her that I just didn't know that I had the strength to do this. And she said to me, you're the only one listening to us. You have to keep going. And so um, in my hard days, um, I have people who believe in me, and, and that's really been profound. Well, thank you for everything you do. Thank you for everything you do for the world. And uh, thank you for um, thinking, taking something that is as deeply personal as grief and loss and looking for policy solutions and teaching us all how we can build a world that actually supports people through these most intimate and difficult experiences. Thank you, and thank you for being with us today. Dr. Gala, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.